In 2014, automotive marketplace website Edmunds published a study that found one in five Americans would give up sex for a month in order to avoid the process of haggling when buying a car, and that one in three would rather do their taxes. A Gallup poll found that car salespeople were ranked dead last in a list of professions and their perceived commitment to honesty and ethics, landing below lawyers, insurance salespeople, and even members of Congress. Safe to say, the public does not like car dealerships very much. But how did that happen? Believe it or not, consumers used to have a lot of options when it came to buying a car. But now, in an age when you can buy anything online, you still can't buy a new car from your phone. Today on Wheelhouse, we're gonna find out why it's illegal to buy a car directly from the manufacturer. It's a little more complicated than you might think. A big thank you to Omaze for sponsoring today's video. Answer me this question. If you could win any BMW, what would it be? Say less, my dude, I totally agree. No question, I would want this 1988 E30 M3. And you know what would be cooler? Winning it with taxes and shipping included, all while helping a good cause. This red racing beauty comes equipped with 2.3 liter naturally aspirated inline four, those signature box flares on the front and the back, and of course, the M3 badges and the grill and trunk panel. So for your chance to win this 1988 BMW M3, go to omaze.com slash donut media and donate. Best of all, every donation supports the skate park project founded by Tony, Mr. Pro Skater himself, Hawk. Now their mission is to fund high quality public skate parks in underserved communities to promote healthy and active lifestyles. So go donate for your chance to win at omaze.com dot com slash donut media now back to the show say you're a tesla fan that lives in texas and you're finally ready to get the ev of your dreams the model s plaid you saddle up and mosey on down to one of 13 tesla galleries operating in the state that's gallery not dealership and take a look at what they have to offer you talk to the helpful staff about models performance options etc and then you inquire about the price well you just made your first mistake why is it that you're not allowed to talk about money when it comes to teslas in texas a lot of people don't know this, but you can't just buy a car directly from a manufacturer. Like you can't walk up to GM's headquarters and buy a Corvette. That's why those companies have dealerships. But Tesla is the exception here because in most states, they have galleries where you can view the cars and talk to experts about them, even discuss the options like I mentioned, but they don't have any traditional dealerships where you can purchase the cars. So how do you actually buy one? Well, first you're gonna have to hop online and order your preferred Tesla through the company's website. Just make sure not standing on the property of a Tesla facility while you do that. You place your order and get your paperwork sent to you from a Tesla store anywhere outside of the state of Texas. Then you can go ahead and pay for the vehicle. Again, as long as you're not on Tesla owned or rented property while you do it. And Tesla can then ship the car to one of eight service centers they have around the state of Texas. At that point, you can go pick up your car and Texas will be more than obliged to register it for you and collect the appropriate taxes due. Congratulations, you can now chew through electrons to your heart's content or until the batteries run out across the Lone Star State. So why the runaround? Well, the very thing that's preventing Texans from buying Teslas directly from the manufacturer is the same thing that prevents you from buying a Chevy or a Ford or a BMW anywhere but a dealership. State franchise laws. These laws were passed way back before Tesla was even an inkling in the minds of Martin Eberhard and Mark Tarpenning, back before World War II, in fact. And the reasons they came about are varied, complicated, and on some levels, antiquated. Before state franchise laws, manufacturers sold their products through many different distribution methods. You had dealer franchises, factory-owned stores, wholesalers, retail department stores, consignment arrangements, even traveling salesmen. I'm not joking. It was the wild west of selling cars, and it was time for the law to come to town. Now, the optimistic story behind state franchise laws is that they were intended to protect the consumer and local communities. The reasoning given back then was that people opening up dealerships were independent entrepreneurs, spending their own money to buy or lease land and equipment, build facilities and hire local people. And if the major auto manufacturers could just come in with their nearly limitless resources at their disposal to set up their own distribution, no one on the local level could possibly compete. 
A local dealership could spend years and hundreds of thousands of dollars establishing a presence in a particular territory, and a manufacturer could just swoop in and run them out of business by undercutting them on price. That's not good. Even if they didn't drive independent dealerships out of business completely, without laws in place to protect local entrepreneurs, manufacturers could just bully anyone they wanted, doing things like forcing dealerships to buy unsold vehicles from the current model year under the threat of not sending any of the upcoming models when they came out. The more cynical take is that the state franchise law model saved the auto manufacturers the money, time, and hassle of opening up their own stores in cities across the country, allowing them to pass that cost on to dealerships and as a result, the buyers, and to quickly establish a presence in multiple markets all at once. So instead of buying your iPhone from the Apple store, it'd be like if you could only buy from a licensed independent dealer who first bought the phones directly from Apple, marked up the product, and then turned around to sell it to you at a higher price. Doesn't sound like a very good deal, does it? Regardless of their reasons, dealerships went around lobbying state legislatures to pass these laws. Their arguments went something like this. Mandating the franchise model will keep the dealerships and their owners as upstanding members of the local community, more likely to hire locally, support local businesses, and take pride in their products and repairs throughout the life of the vehicle. More than that, in markets large enough to support more than one dealership of any particular manufacturer, the franchise model will foster competition, driving down prices and giving an incentive for dealerships to go the extra mile in pleasing the customer, whether that's better financing options or better sales and service experience. For example, if every Chrysler dealership is owned by Chrysler, the price of a 1952 Imperial is the same no matter what showroom you happen to wander into, giving no incentive for competitive pricing. And when it comes time for a recall or a repair, it's a lot harder for a franchise owner to live down shoddy warranty work when your kids both play on the same Little League team. Unfortunately though, these predictions haven't exactly come to pass in reality or even by dealers' own admissions. Manufacturers already set their market price at the highest point they can get away with, whether that's at a wholesale or retail level. And any attempt to increase over that price point would just drive down the demand in an elastic market, offering an advantage to the competition. And with the franchise model requiring dealerships to maintain huge inventories of cars, the cost of that maintenance will always be passed on to the consumer. In fact, as I said earlier, that's the very reason why dealerships initially started lobbying for these laws in the first place. The worry that they put in the effort to establish a foothold in a certain market only to have the manufacturers come in and take over by offering the product at a lower price. The dealers already admitted that they simply can't compete with manufacturers when it comes to price, a fact that should be obvious to anyone. These arguments were very successful, at least at the state level. And today, every US state has some version of franchise laws on the books. And federally, with the Automobile Dealers Day in Court Act of 1956, say that three times fast, dealers are allowed to bring a federal suit against any manufacturer who fails to comply with the terms of a franchise agreement or terminates, cancels, or refuses to renew a franchise. Sounds good, right? So where did we go wrong? Well, today your local dealership probably isn't very local or at least the numbers are trending that way. Today, there are around 17,000 dealers nationwide, compared to more than 22,000 just 10 years ago. That's a drop of around 20%, and the trend is continuing. Your average dealer is far from the mom and pop shop of yesteryear who struggled to just barely make a living. Massive publicly traded dealership groups like AutoNation and Lithium Motors are buying up and consolidating independent dealerships as quickly as they can. And the result is higher costs for you and higher profits for them. In the last decade, Lithia saw their sales revenue jump from 2 billion to 12.7 billion, and AutoNation saw an increase from 12.5 billion to 21.3 billion, and that's not just because of inflation. According to the National Auto Dealer Association, the 16,623 franchised light vehicle dealers in the US sold 14.5 million light duty vehicles in 2020, a drop of about 15% from the 17.1 million sold in 2019. And yet, with total sales topping $980 billion in 2020, that represents an increase of almost 50%. And that's not even counting the money they make off repairs. Including that, and you can add another $100 million to the count. So how does that math work out? Well, it's mostly COVID's fault. Long story short, the bottom fell out of the car market in the spring of last year, factories were shut down, and supply lines were disrupted. 
No one knew what was going to happen in the world, let alone the auto industry. Then people started shopping again, and the problem was there weren't any cars to be had. Demand returned, but supply hadn't rebounded yet. That's a recipe for disaster for the average consumer, and dealers had an appetite for destruction that ended up putting a squeeze on the car buying public. We're actually going to go way more in depth on COVID's effect on the car market and the aftermarket in a few weeks, so make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss that. But surprisingly, there's good news on the horizon. A major portion of the cost of the vehicles we buy comes from transportation, moving all those vehicles around to the various dealer lots and in unsold dealer inventory. A 2009 analysis by the US Department of Justice found that in 2008, there were $100 billion worth of vehicles just sitting on dealer lots, incurring a cost of around $900 million annually. Keeping cars on hand costs money. Dealers have to pay for huge lots, employees to move, wash, and maintain them, and more. That same study found that if our national dealer system moved to a build-to-order model like they use in other markets around the world, costs could be reduced by 8.6%. I know that doesn't sound like much, but with the average car price tag eclipsing $40,000 this year, an extra $3,500 bucks in your pocket doesn't sound too bad, does it? Costs aside, who wants to be beholden to whatever the dealer has on the lot? Even with the average dealer having nearly 600 new and used vehicles in their inventory, it seems like you can never manage to find exactly what you want. Not to mention the cost to the environment and the wasted space. It seems to benefit no one. It's extra cost for the dealers and less choice for the buyer. And in a world where anyone with a smartphone can find out exactly what dealers are paying for cars, what cars are actually available in their area, and what everyone else has already paid to buy them, the benefits of the dealerships are dwindling. The COVID-19 pandemic has meant that customers and dealers alike have had to shift expectations and deliverables. With more shopping happening online, people being more willing to wait for the exact car they want, contactless interactions, and benefits that would have been unheard of just two years ago, like return policies up to seven days if you don't like your purchase. This is already happening, and it doesn't have to end here. Even small steps like taking care of the majority of paperwork at home and online would have a massive effect on the overall satisfaction customers have with the dealership buying experience, something that has been historically and notoriously low. Look, I know a fair amount of people that have worked at dealerships. I know some of you watching might also work at dealerships. We've worked with car dealerships and they've always been great places, but something has to change in this process if we want consumers to be happy with their buying experience again. A car is the most expensive consumer product most of us will ever buy. And I know I'd prefer to get exactly what I want with the exact color and the exact options I choose rather than having to settle from the limited selection at a local dealership. Getting all that at a cheaper price without having to haggle for hours and drudge through the mounds of boring paperwork sounds pretty great. But for all the talk about franchise laws protecting the consumer, we've really gotten the raw end of the deal. It's taken a company like Tesla with a disruptive new technology and piles of cash to finally make some headway in breaking the momentum that the franchise model has built up. The timing is right too. The auto industry is experiencing a historic wave of upheaval right now with manufacturers closing plants, canceling models and revamping production, figuring new stuff out, new technology. Let's extend that to the franchise model and build a new system that benefits dealers, buyers, and even the environment, preferably before I go to buy my next car. All right, thank you very much for watching Wheelhouse. Let me know what you think of car dealerships down in the comments. What have your experiences been like? If you have a good story, a bad story, let me know. What could they have done better? What did they do right? I wanna hear about it. I think some car dealers are probably gonna be looking at these. Follow Donut Media on all social media, at Donut Media. Follow me, at Nolan J. Sykes. If you're a donut super freak, hit that join button down below if you haven't already joined the Donut Underground. You get access to a Discord channel, exclusive merch, uh, exclusive videos. We've got a fair amount of those now. It's pretty awesome, they're all awesome. They're all great. Be kind, I'll see you next time.